We'll start anyway. Unless a few of you, we've got a minute or so, if a few of you want to have a few more answers while it's up there. But I think uh, it's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, most of you have gone for RTGs, radioisotope thermal generators. There's a few that said photovoltaic. So I, I realized last, m on Monday, I introduced all about um, solar power, solar array, solar power, and, and so there's a big emphasis there. But what happens, and this is what we're going to look at today, what happens when we move further away from the sun and the power that we get from the sun is no longer sufficient to, to give us power for our spacecraft? That's what we call deep space. We're going further away, further into our solar system and out of our solar system. What, what sort of power sources do we need to be able to power our spacecraft in those conditions? I briefly mentioned to you um, about fuel cells, RTGs, and batteries. Um, these would probably be the most likely sources because as you get further away from the sun, your, your solar rays have got to become bigger and bigger and bigger, and we'll look at that in a minute, in order to be able to, to provide the power. The problem with fuel cells and batteries is, is they're sort of relatively short-lived. So the best solution when, you're, when you want a long-term mission that's going to go far away from the sun into deep space is something like an RTG. Um, there are obviously disadvantages of that, and we'll look at those as we, as, as we progress, but just that's, that kind of bear that in mind as we go forward. But I, I think there's a, a sort of mixed bag of the message that got across on Monday. Um, I'll try and put this, the laptop up on both screens now. Did you say that one of the recordings didn't have um, any, any data on it? Was that... Show, okay. I don't remember what report it is exactly. I'll have a look back on there and see if I can. Okay, all right. So today, um, well, I'll go, go through. Uh, this is an example of a mission, and you can, I'll, I'll give you the link for this in, in the notes um, or online, and you can have a look at it. But this is a, was Voyager, one of the early missions from the 70s, that is now very much in deep space. I think Voyager 2 is still actually transmitting. I'm not sure whether Voyager 1 or one of the others is still transmitting data. Okay, so it's 40-odd um, years old and still operating, which is quite impressive for, for uh, the technology at the time, but also the time period. Um, and you can see here, I think it's there where the RTG is um, located on this satellite. Okay, there's a big dish there to be able to do communications. As it gets further away, it needs to have a bigger, uh, big um, antenna, big dish to be able to communicate. And we'll look at the, the geometry of antennas and how the antennas work uh, next week as well, so we can see what, why that might be the case that we've got that sort of massive dish there. But, um, yeah, anyone know why, why we've got this RTG kind of put quite far away from the main body of the spacecraft, yeah. Yeah, so they're, they're radioactive, they're, they're producing heat by a radioactive decay, so that radioactive decay can interfere with um, some of the sensitive instruments on board the spacecraft and the electronics. So it's ideal um, to kind of isolate them a little bit from, from the, those sensitive components, and you can stick them out on a limb like that, so you'll often see them um, located somewhere like that. Okay, so today, we've, well, last Monday, we, we covered the power system architecture, and we looked at... Um, uh, solar arrays, so we looked at one primary power source, which was solar arrays. Today I want to look at RTGs in a little bit more detail and fuel cells, and then talk a little bit about power storage, batteries, and look into how we might start doing battery and array sizing, because that's what you're going to do tomorrow in, in the MATLAB tutorial. You're going to look at power systems and how we might um, like size the power system for particular missions and, and how we might... Um, kind of identify what power systems are appropriate for what, for what missions. Okay, but as I said, power, power generation deep, deep space. So this is our sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, our moon there, Mars, Jupiter. As we get kind of out to Jupiter, this, the energy from the sun starts to, because it's been dissipated over this massive area, it starts to be much less 
in a, cons in a given area. So the, um, the watts per meter squared is much more reduced. So it's no longer about, uh, at Earth, it's about 1,400 watts per meter squared above the uh, atmosphere. Out by Jupiter, it's, it's much, much lower. Um, so the, that uh, kind of insulation reduces by 1 over R squared. Okay, so that means in order to have a solar array uh, that powering a spacecraft, you're going to have to have a very large area, which implies high mass. Okay, you're going to have to support that structure, but you're going to have to be able to keep that stiff and pointing towards the sun as well. We looked last week, uh, sorry, we looked on Monday about temperature effects on, on solar arrays. So that has an ad advantageous effect. As we get further away, when our solar arrays get cooler, they actually operate a little bit better. So we get a little bit more out of them. They're a bit more efficient as they're, get, as they're cooler. So that actually improves their performance a little bit. But still, it's not really enough to give us the performance we might need for, for largely um, large powered systems. So beyond Jupiter, typically solar arrays are quite a poor option for, for powering our cars. If we could improve the efficiency, they might improve a little bit, but generally we would, it would, we would have to look to other systems. And this is where RTGs come in. So sorry, do we have any questions about that? Or does that all kind of seem fairly straightforward? Is there any surprises there? Are we happy with that? Okay. Yep. So if you go further from the sun, the solar rays are cooling, leading to a small performance boost, right? Yes, so we get a little bit of a performance boost because the arrays are um, not heated up as much by, by the solar power, but uh, we get a much more, much greater performance reduction because we're further away and that energy is basically spread over a much larger area. So. Um, the way that radio, radioisotope thermal generators work is they use the radioactive decay that generates of some sort of radioactive element that generates heat, and then we can convert that heat into electrical energy. So, have anyone used a, a thermocouple before? Have you come across that? What, what a thermocouple is for measuring temperature? Not in A levels, not not in high school. Never never heard of a thermocouple. Okay. Well, the word couple means it's, it's two dissimilar metals, and if you put two dissimilar metals together, you weld them together at a point, and you stick them on something warm, they will create a voltage between those two. So you'll, you'll generate a, a small current. Okay, so that's actually generating electricity from the heat. So you're using the energy in the heat um, and, and converting it into electrical energy. And that's what the thermoelectric effect is. And thermocouples use that thermoelectric effect to measure temperature. So you can see what temperature is it, how, how you're measuring a very small, you're converting that temperature effectively into an electrical current. Um, Thermoelectric uh, generators use the same thing. So they use that thermoelectric effect to take that heat energy and convert it into electrical energy. And you create this voltage. And if you have a circuit then, so you have these two materials, you have the, the hot region here, so you have your... Um, radioactive element here giving out heat um, and you have uh, the circuit here and this, this side of the, the system is cold okay so there's, there's, there's this then um, this temperature difference created and this, this at this couple region here there's this voltage created between these two materials and if they're part of this electrical circuit and then these are your loads on your spacecraft so your loads might be all of the different subsystems that are you're being powered on the spacecraft then you will generate a current around that circuit and you will power things. Any questions there? Does that seem relatively straightforward? Any question? Yeah? No, no question. Okay. Okay, so you, you generate this voltage similar to a thermocouple. So a thermocouple obviously used for measurement, but here we're actually using it to our advantage for power. So what, how, how, what is this? What are these sources that provide this heat? Um, so, <coughs> Uh, radioactive emission is, is, is this emission of very high energy particles, and we then absorb that uh, heat. Um, so we need to choose our sources wisely. Okay, so we want to choose sources um, that uh, decay products are easily absorbed, so alpha, beta radiation. Um, and there are a range of sources that we can choose. So polonium, 
has quite a good power density of 82 watts per gram. So do you think that, that would be probably maybe one of the, 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 the sources that you might want to use? Plutonium seems to be quite low. Um, so does strontium. But why do you think we actually go for using plutonium and strontium over polonium and curium in, in our system? Yep? Their half-lives are several orders of magnitude longer than the others. Exactly. So we're really looking for long-term power here. So polonium and curium basically give out all of their energy really rapidly. Okay, so half-life means how much the energy decays by... Um, in, the half of the energy, uh, what is the time it takes for half of the energy to, to uh, decay to. So if half of our energy decays uh, or disappears or is dissipated in 0.38 years, that's not going to give us a satellite or a spacecraft that's going to work for 40 odd years. Because if you look at this graph here, you can see polonium, curium, they, are, they rapidly decay in power, whereas the other two, there's a very slow decay rate. Um, so plutonium tends to be the most common, but obviously it's trying to source these. And then there's the disadvantage of it. It's um, watts per, ki per kilogram or watts per gram is quite low. So we've got to balance that out. But um, if we want a power source, and we, that's what we're trying to take with us, our heat that we're taking with us um, throughout our mission, we want something that's going to last for a long time. We can estimate our decay rates. So we can estimate the performance based on, on that, this equation here. So this is just uh, natural log 2 divided by the half-life times the time of the mission. Um, and that, if, you, if you plot that graph, that's what you get there. And it depends then on the half-life. So go away MATLAB if you want to, plot a few graphs and, and have a look at that, see, see how those behave. Um, just get familiar with, with the, the format of the equations. But you can see then that the performance is going to be um, a lot better if, if you, for, going to last you a lot longer if you've got this um, much, much longer half-life. So 80, 86 years for the case of plutonium and 28 years for the case of strontium. So we can see that those will be very suitable for these long duration missions. So yeah, as I say, high activity, you're basically burning, it's like you're taking your sun with you and you're burning out your sun very, very quickly. You've got a very short-lived source. So, some of the advantages. So, any, any, sorry, before I move on, any questions around that? Are we kind of happy with that? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so some of the advantages of RTGs, um, and this is uh, the Galileo spacecraft. Does anyone know where Galileo went? Not the person, but the spacecraft. <laughs> And I know that there is a new Galileo um, constellation, which is the, the um, uh, European GPS network. But um, does anyone know where the Galileo spacecraft? No? OK. So the spacecraft in the, in the 80s, 90s, um, and it, it was doing some observations around Jupiter. So you can see that they're already, they've chosen Jupiter. Um, so there's, there's, haven't used solar arrays because um, but they're a bit too far away from the sun. Uh, we've got these RTGs placed far away from all the sensitive equipment. Why do you think this plasma wave antenna is, is kind of placed all the way out here? Yeah? Remember what I said earlier about RTGs and messing with your components? Yeah. So the plasma wave antenna was very, very sensitive equipment. So it really, that was the main um, kind of sensor on board the, the system, and it had to be... Um, kind of isolated from those RTGs, so pushed it, put as far away as possible. So they, they had a little uh, boom that, that extended, and they could then um, place that really far away from the RTGs. So the advantages here um, for RTGs are power production is independent of your spacecraft orientation. So in a solar-powered spacecraft, you either have to point the solar arrays at the sun to get the most, or you have to point the entire spacecraft if the solar arrays are fixed on the spacecraft. It's also independent of the distance from the sun, so you're taking your energy source with you. Uh, you can get low power levels for a very long time, so that's quite good. Um, and they're not susceptible, uh, ironically enough, in a, to radiation damage. They cause radiation damage of other, um, other components, but they're not susceptible themselves to radiation damage, okay, so the power source. Whereas solar arrays can be degraded by radiation damage 
in the Van Allen belts or in, in our Earth environments. Um, so, so over time, their performance um, remains relatively constant. Okay, they're obviously decaying the amount of power they use uh, have available because that's reducing very very slowly um, if their half life is very long. But some of the disadvantages then are they adversely affect the spacecraft radiation environment. And you have to have very ha careful handling procedures in order to integrate them onto your spacecraft to make sure that whoever is doing that integration, the, the uh, technicians and the people supporting the integration of the spacecraft aren't going to be um, damaged or ad adversely affected by that. Um, they also have a kind of high temperature operation and that will impact the thermal environment. So it's another reason why you might want to have them a bit isolated because you've got my very large thermal gradients in your spacecraft if you've got these. And they, ve they very much interfere again with these sensitive payloads. That's why you might want to stick things out on antennas. So they're going to change the configuration of your spacecraft quite, quite considerably. Uh, if you've got an RTG, you have to think about how you, how you kind of mount things and how you configure that. Okay, any, any questions on that? Yeah, full of questions this morning. Okay. Uh, so performance-wise, um, RTGs are not not highly efficient. Okay, they're they're particularly our only option for, for at the currently for long-term missions. So so um, we kind of uh, take the hit on efficiency there. So the efficiency is typically around six to ten percent. They have these big fins here. Why, why do you think we've got big fins like that? Yep. Increase Yeah, okay, so, so because they're not super efficient, uh, imagine 6 to 10%, so 90%, 94% of that heat energy is actually needs to be dissipated somewhere. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a pain, but if we could make them a bit more efficient, and there, there are ways to do that, but it it's, it's kind of makes the system a bit heavier, a bit more difficult to operate. So... We generally have to dissipate a fair amount of the heat away. So, yeah? Yes, why don't we, why don't we dissipate this heat into operating other systems like Stirling engines? That could be an option, yeah. So, so Stir Stirling engines obviously have their own mass associated with it. So it's, it's all a balance, a kind of a trade-off between what, what's, uh, what you're going to get out of the system, how much power you need, um, and all of that. So, so when you're looking in design, and next year there might be a, a thing that you could, could look into, how could you couple these sort of power systems to actually improve the performance overall, depending on what your overall system requirements are? So, so that, that's always the balance when you're looking at design as a whole, is you're kind of trading off lots of different requirements. So you can see a few spacecraft have um, used these. So uh, the Apollo landers in the 70s, so that's one on the surface of the moon. Um, Cassini, we use one, that's one of the most recent. Um, and the, the specific power, a little bit higher in, in, the, in the later ones, so they've improved the performance a little bit up to about 10%. So, so they're getting a little bit more out of, out of them, but it depends on the, on the mission requirements, as I said. It's not always just a function of what's the maximum you can get from that system. Any, any questions on that or anything? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, other than... RTGs, the other type of, of main type of power system we come across on spacecraft um, are fuel cells. So anyone, anyone heard of fuel cell before? Yep, yeah? okay. I think, we, I think we might use them to power cars in the future. Yeah, so they are one of the potential options for electric vehicles for powering. And what the advantages of a fuel cell over a battery is, it, as it says, it uses fuel. So you fill in hydrogen and oxygen, Okay, so, so you can effectively recharge a fuel cell by recharging hydrogen and oxygen. So it's very quick to kind of recharge the system in a way. But basically the hydrogen and oxygen come in um, and then they permeate through uh, little membranes here and here to, uh, create, to go through this electrolyte to generate an electric current. Okay, so they react through this electrolyte. Um, losing electrons and gaining electrons to generate this current. <coughs> <coughs> Most fuel cells um, are based on this um, hydrogen-oxygen uh, reaction. 
There are other, other types, but the, the majority of fuel cells use, use hydrogen and oxygen. Fuel cells on Apollo were first used in, in space on Apollo missions, and they, they used the, the hydrogen and oxygen reaction. So what happens, you think, the hint there on, on the, that graph, on the picture, but what, what happens when we, do, when we have a reaction between hydrogen and oxygen? What, what might we create? What products might we get? So we've got our reactants, hydrogen and oxygen. What we get? Someone said, yep, yeah, water. Yeah, so we're going to produce some water out of this reaction. So we've got, at our anode, we've got what we call a dissociation, an oxidation reaction. So that means we lose electrons. So our electrons are in our anode region here, are, are being are moved away, and they're generating a current that drives around into our cathode. At our cathode, we have a reduction reaction, which is a gain of electrons. And that's the, the chemical reaction that's occurring at the anode. That's the chemical reaction that's occurring at the cathode. And overall, we get so H2, so some hydrogen plus some oxygen, we get a product of water. Okay. So this could be an advantage. It could be a good thing. Um, it could be a bad thing. So we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. But typically, the performance of fuel cells is quite good. So it's 40 to 60%. So that's why they're considered a potential uh, alternative to batteries. They're quite, quite, high, quite good efficiency, although batteries are, are very efficient. Uh, fuel cells are still pretty, pretty efficient. Um, and certainly for cars, for car batteries, the, the, or car power, electrical power, the advantage is you can recharge them effectively very quickly by fueling them up. You've got to change the infrastructure to have stations that could fill a fuel cell with hydrogen and oxygen, so storage of hydrogen and oxygen in fuel, uh, petrols or fuel stations around the country could be quite a challenge, okay, to try and distribute hydrogen and oxygen around, around uh, the country, uh, but it's a potential option. So you can see some missions where, that have used fuel cells, so Gemini, Apollo, and the shuttle mission. Um, why do you think it might have been an advantage for, for some of these missions? What's uh, something co common with, with some of these missions? Yeah? They're very long. Um, they're relatively long, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, Gemini wasn't, wasn't that long. The but the space shuttle or the one that carried Pete Bob. Yeah, not another. Disabled They're all banned, yeah, yeah. So, so did someone else say that? Sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah, so we're creating water, okay? So, so for manned missions, that's, that's a positive. We've got some water out of, so we can use, um, we can reuse effectively that fuel that we've reacted and created water. So, so there's, a, there's a plus there. Um, so that's one of the, the key advantages. We'll go through some of the others, but one of the key, key advantages for fuel cells, again, is constant power. So again, we're not reliant on the attitude or, um, of our spacecraft or solar, solar illumination levels to, ge to generate power. We've brought the fuel with us, our hydrogen and our oxygen, okay? Um, and then we can generate that power as long as we have fuel. So, so that's a hint to a possible disadvantage. They're quite compact compared to um, equivalent solar arrays. So their, their energy density is quite good. Um, and they produce water as a byproduct. So for manned missions, that's a, that's a plus, because although we've used up that fuel for the power generation, we can reuse it in, in the water hydration system for, for humans on board the spacecraft. So, so it, there is a reusability for that. Some of the key disadvantages are that lifetime, okay? So they're relatively short lifetime. It's compar compared to RTGs, very, quite short. Um, as we, if we have, want to have high power, we're going to use our fuel up quite quickly, and we have to carry our fuel with us. Something like shuttle or ISS, what might be the advantages? I mean, shuttle, okay, it's no longer operational, but ISS, what might be the advantages of having a fuel cell on a, on a system like that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so we can, we can in, in, some, in, a, in a space station or somewhere where we're, we are having missions that are going up and servicing that, so, so that's one of the satellites of, of Earth that we do service quite regularly, because we have humans on board, 
So we need to give them food, we need to give them water, and we can bring up fuel as well. And then we're bringing up fuel and having the added advantage that we're generating water from that system. So, so there's, there's an advantage there. Um, but for unmanned missions, that <laughs> water production is potentially um, a bad thing. Why do you think that might not be so useful for unmanned missions? If you drift it out, it just comes back. <laughs> yeah, it, it comes back. Yeah, so, so if we eject um, water out from our spacecraft, it's going to freeze, in, in, uh, certainly in the vacuum. And um, in, in sunlight, it may, it may evaporate, but certainly in, in the deep space um, and in the shadow, it's going to freeze. Um, and that's going to have an impact. If, it, if it's a vapor, it's also a problem because it might condense on, on very cold surfaces. Um, so some mirrors for telescopes or optics for our, our cameras. Those are the sort of things where, where vapors will start to condense in that, in that cold um, region. And so we don't want that. And if it freezes, that's even, even more worse because even worse because we've got ice particles that could impact our spacecraft in the same orbit. So, so the, then the relative velocities are quite high um, and that could, could cause uh, detrimental effects to spacecraft in those orbits or spacecraft near our, our spacecraft. So yeah, it's, it's not a great advantage for, for unmanned missions. It's, it's pretty, pretty bad. Um, any questions on that? Anything? Yeah? So um, how do you store your hydrogen on, uh, on vehicle? Because it's a pretty like, unstable molecule, and especially seeing like, how the SLS democracy like, experiences a few hydrogen leaks. Yeah, so, so it would have to be stored under pressure. Uh, it could be liquefied as well so to kind of improve your storage. So then it would be cryogenic. So you'd have to, sim similar, similar to if you've got a hydrogen powered uh, rocket propulsion system, um, you've got to store it under pressure. Um, and even if it's if very, very high pressure, it will liquefy. And then it's going to be, have to be cooled down in order to remain liquid. So there's disadvantages there if, if you're kind of cryogenics where, where you've stored at very high pressures and very low temperatures because it's going to boil off. Uh, but again, yeah, still disadvantages, you've got to have these um, pressure tanks, pressurized vessels, which is not ideal on any system because if, if, if you have a, a leak, then that's quite a catastrophic um, system. So you've got to design those pressure vessels to be very, very, uh, very, very strong. So if you see fuel cell um, architecture, you'll see these little uh, cylinder or vessel, pressure vessel shaped type things all coupled together and that, that's where they're storing the fuel. So yeah, good question. <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. So the water produces distilled water, so how do we make it like So you, you can add, like, you can take salts and nutrients and add, add them in. So, so I mean, that, that's a rep for fewer humans if you need to put electrolytes in and things like that to make sure, sure that, that it's, it's properly balanced, that that's a, like a powder you can put in. Um, so that's, that's not, not so much of an issue, but yeah, it still has to be done if, if you want to use it. But there are other things that humans might use water for um, and that don't necessarily need to put, put electrolytes back in. Yeah, but if you're, if you're drinking it, yeah, you, pro you probably want to do that. So good question. Yep. Okay, so any, any other questions on that? Are we kind of happy enough with that? Yep. Okay, so we'll move on from our primary power to, to looking at power storage. So how do we, how do we store our, our power if we've got a solar array or if we've got another way of generating power on our spacecraft? How do we store that to be able to get through those periods where we've got eclipse? or where we're not able to generate power. Um, so this, this principal source are, are batteries. So there's various different battery chemistries. So um, you can see some examples here of a silver zinc one from Mars Pathfinder, lithium ion, probably most, most of you are familiar with lithium ion battery technology. Most of your mobile phones are powered by this. Uh, or there's nickel me metal hydrides from Mars Odyssey. So there's various different um, chemistries that we can use for batteries. And why, why might we want to look at different chemistries? What, what, you think they'll have different features or? Yep. Yes, they do have different features. Yep. Which is, so, which is, which is something very important. Different 
energy densities, power densities. Yeah, so, so that's one of the main features, things is, is what their energy density or power density, because we're, we're really in spacecraft design, we're very focused on how much can we get into a given volume, because that's what our constraints are. Our launch vehicle has a certain volume that it can, can get into orbit. Mass also is a, is, a, is a constraint, but volume is much more a constraint on launch vehicles. Then, then I mean, mass goes along with volume, but volume is, is the bigger one. So, so energy density is always a, a, a thing that we're looking at. Uh, so we've got primary cells. So primary cells are a bit like our, our primary power source. We'll charge them up, or we'll, we'll, they'll have, from their, their chemistry, they'll, they'll be able to operate for a particular period of time, and then, then they'll no longer operate. Okay, so they're not rechargeable. We can't reverse um, the, rea the chemical reactions within them to, to be able to re recharge them, to reset them. So we ha th those would be used principally for very short duration missions or for missions where we want to kind of um, have a, a power source um, for a particular period of time and then we don't need to use that anymore. So it might be for an instrument on board a longer duration mission that's powering something. So Mars Pathfinder used, used them. Um, Sputnik used, as I mentioned uh, on Monday, used this silver zinc um, primary power source. But our secondary power source, our rechargeable ones, are these, these are the this is nickel, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, or lithium ion batteries that we can actually reverse those um, chemical reactions and, and recharge them, so be able to then reuse them for, for many, many cycles. So what might be important um, in a rechargeable battery? What might be important features of a rechargeable battery? Yep. How quickly it can recharge? Yeah, so the recharge rate might be, might be important. What else? Yep. The number of cycles. The number of cycles is certainly very critical, because if we can only recharge them for a very few cycles, Think about a low Earth orbit. How many cycles might you be going through in low Earth orbit in a year, say? Or even in a day? What's the, what's the typical um, duration period of a low Earth orbit? Of a very low Earth orbit, yep. Around the length of a feature length film, around yeah. at least 90 minutes. Okay, 90 minutes to a couple of hours in low Earth orbit. So how many cycles in a day are you likely to have if you've got 90 minutes to, to an hour or two hours? 16. 16, 12, 16 cycles. So already, that's just one day. So if your satellite wants to in orbit for a year, you've got how many cycles? 16 times 365. Who's, who's quick on the draw? <laughs> Probably about 5,000, somewhere like that. Uh, yeah, 5,000. Uh, this is like rough numbers. But you start to see, uh, you're starting to get into big numbers there with your numbers of cycles. So you've got to be able to um, charge and recharge your battery in that, that, those sort of levels. Um, they've got to be able to power your system during uh, eclipses or perhaps even when you've got peak power loads. So you might use your battery during solar time a little bit to top up the system if, you, if you're operating some of your science instruments or some of your, your um, onboard systems, if it's a comm satellite, um, the communications payloads and things like that. So, so then you would need to, to have a little bit extra, extra power. Um, in geostationary or geosynchronous, um, you, you generally have an eclipse season. So very few periods of the year you'll have a time where you'll have some eclipse. But most of the time, you're operating. Because your, your orbit is very far away from the Earth, so the Earth only takes up a very small portion of the orbital period, and um, it, the, it only includes you for a very small portion, the eclipses are, are very limited. But in low Earth orbits, you've got quite um, long eclipses. They can be up to 40% of the orbit period. If we're in sun synchronous orbit, so what do we know about sun synchronous orbits? Yes, yeah, so they're kind of tracking the, the sun as, as it's going around in, in throughout, throughout the year. 
only if your, your sun synchronous is dawn dusk. And you still have eclipse periods in, in a dawn dusk. There'll still be periods where throughout the year there'll be a little bit of waving and a little bit of variation and, and the satellite might go into a bit of an eclipse. So you'll still have to have some sort of batteries. You can't get away with, with just using solar power. And there'll be slight variations in the power generated throughout the year as well. So you still need to have that capacity from the battery to be able to give you that constant level or increased level of power. Okay, so just to go through a little bit of the terminology that you might see for batteries, uh, we've got the total capacity. Um, you've come across perhaps this term before in amp hours. You probably looked at your batteries and say you're kind of looking at uh, power packs and seeing how many amp hours do they provide, what's best, okay? So, so that's how we kind of measure the capacity of a battery, is, is the, um, the current it provides for the time, the length of time it provides. The number of discharge and charge cycles is an important parameter, so we call that N. Okay, we want to know about that. The depth of discharge, what, what do you think the depth of discharge might be? Yeah, pretty much. It's like how how kind of how low can you go as, as you imagine it? How how much can you drain your battery before it actually starts to become a bit detrimental to your battery long term performance or even short term performance? So what what's the advisable discharge? Do many of you drain your batteries to zero on your mobile phones or do all of you try and keep it topped up? Yeah, so so it, it's how you kind of manage your battery to make sure it's always kind of operating at the best possible. Um, rate and keeps its, its battery life for long, as long as possible. So it's that percentage of battery capacity that's used in, in a discharge. So a 75% depth of discharge means that you have 25% left of the battery. So you've used up 75%. That's how, how low you're going. In your the total stored energy of the battery. So that's basically just the battery capacity times the discharge voltage. Okay, so capacity times voltage, um, we get units of watt hour. Okay. The energy density, this is a really important one, because okay, it tells us like what's the, what's the kind of performance if we're, we're looking at different battery technologies, how can we compare one to another to be able to say, well, that's got much higher energy density, so actually I can fit more of those batteries in for a given um, mass or volume. So that's the stored energy per unit mass. And that's what hours per kilogram. So they're <laughs> fairly self-explanatory. The charge rate is the rate at which the battery can accept charge. So again, that was an important factor you've identified because if, if you have a quicker charge rate, that means that then you can charge up your battery quickly. So if, you're, if your period of sunlight is, is um, not very long, you still, you're still able to charge quite quickly. And that, un that unit is amps because basically you're pushing charge, current, through in a time rate. So the average battery discharge voltage is another important parameter, so VB for all that. Um, and the number of cells in series sort of determines that. that. So each, if you look on the, on the table here, oops, units are volts, if you look on the table here we can see for these different uh, battery uh, chemistries what the nominal cell voltage is. So that's the voltage for each cell. And your phone battery will, will consist of a number of cells in order to get a voltage for that circuit. Okay? So if, you're, if your overall circuit requires a voltage of 5 volts, how many cells in a, of nickel cadmium do you need? 1.25, 5 divided by 1.25. Roughly. I'm hearing eight, I'm hearing four. <laughs> it's probably about four, okay. Yeah. So you, you need about four cells to generate five volts. So if, you, if you've got a higher voltage requirement, you'll need more cells. So you'll, you'll string them together to create the voltage. But that's, uh, that's all the voltage you'll get out of one cell. So that's one kind of anode, cathode, and the, that electrical reaction that you're having in between. And you can see that the, for these different um, 
battery uh, chemistry is what their sort of mission lifetime. So lithium ion doesn't look that good in terms of space performance because it's pretty low. Okay, so, so it's kind of down at two years. You, I mean, we, we could see that in electrical technology we have in our, in our pockets. Okay, your phone battery typically works for, for a couple of years and then it starts to kind of die out. I think, you, did you have a question or? No, okay. Yeah, so temperature does have an, a, a massive effect on the battery performance as well. So ideally, you'd want to try and insulate your battery or place it close to components that are generating heat so that you keep your battery warm. Because if your battery gets too cold, then its, it's charge and its discharge rate change, change kind of quite dramatically. So yeah, that's, that is an important factor. And particularly for space systems as well, where, where we're very much trying to manage the temperature on board the spacecraft. Okay, so we've got some sort of hysteresis in, in our batteries as well. So um, although we charge and discharge, um, we'll have some sort of loss over time that's, that's reversible and some sort of irreversible loss. And this is why then that performance over very long periods of time, potentially for some uh, systems or even shorter periods for others, starts to, to uh, degrade. So we can do for some battery chemistries we can do is sort of reconditioning. And the way we recondition for nickel cadmium is we actually do a very, very deep discharge. So we go very, very low, okay, and that allows us to kind of recondition um, all that the kind of chemistry within that battery to be able to get back some of the performance. So we can do this over several periods, but we will have some irreversible loss. So over time, that, that kind of pink region there will get bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually our, our performance will be, be degraded significantly though, so we'll no longer be able to use that battery. So um, again, the depth of discharge um, affects the, the charge cycle. So I, we talked about this before. So for LEO spacecraft, we went through the numbers. The typical kind of orbits are around about 100 minutes. So that gives us about 5,000 cycles per year. So if you've got a mission that's maybe five, ten years, that could be ten to the four cycles over their lifetime. So you're dealing with quite large numbers here, and you want to see how these different um, kind of chemistries perform. You can look at these, these sort of charts to see. I've only got one point on the lithium ion because I didn't have, they, they really started to sort of drop off significantly for these cycles. So there actually are, isn't data, I couldn't find any data that could populate this sort of region. But for nickel met metal cadmium and nickel hydride, you can see you can go up to sort of reasonably high numbers of cycles and still maintain some sensible depths of discharge. But nickel, nickel hydride is, is sort of probably the most used battery chemistry because of its performance for over that long duration. But we have this capacity loss. So the higher um, depths of discharge on each cycle leads us to um, capacity a quicker capacity loss. But for some chemistries, we can use that depth of discharge over to recondition our battery. But we have to do that very carefully in order to be able to, to maintain the battery performance. Um, so, yeah, battery life cycle then is dependent on, on this, how many cycles can we, can we do over our overall. Over our. And if it, um, typically if it falls below 80%, then, then that's defined as kind of, the, the sort of a degradation zone where, where our battery is no longer kind of going to operate as we, we expect it to. Okay, so any, any questions on that? Or we're all happy with that? Yeah. What I'd like to move on to in the last few slides is first of all looking at um, and what you'll be doing next year is, is a little bit of this, is how we start assessing for a spacecraft mission, what is the power requirements, and how do we then start to estimate how we size our power system. And in your, in your tutorial on Friday, you're going to do a little bit of that. Look at the sizing of different types of power systems and see and match those to different types of missions. So here's a real-world example of um, a spacecraft called SOHO. Anyone heard of SOHO? You nod. Lots of blank faces. Okay, so SOHO stands for uh, 
if I get this right, Solar Heliospheric Observatory. So SOHO is a spacecraft, a satellite, that is at one of the Lagrange points in front of, I, I don't know if uh, Dr. McGrath talked about Lagrange points with you. So if you think about kind of two um, masses and you've got the, the, uh, the gravitational distribution between them, there's a point somewhere where the, their kind of gravity is, is equal and, and so the, there's a saddle point. We've heard of saddle points before in maths? You've done saddle point? Yeah? So it's a, it's a, a saddle point in, the, in the, the, kind of the gravitational field. And that allows a, a satellite to kind of sit there um, and orbit within that saddle point. Okay? And this satellite is, is sitting at a point that's close to the sun, and it's looking at the sun. So it's, it's a, a solar observer trying to see what's happening in the heliosphere of our sun, what's going on, so we can start to understand the physics of our sun. So it's, it's very close to the sun. It's got, well, close as, as, as most satellites can get, and it's got to have some thermal management, and it's got to have some way to communicate the data back to Earth. So, so this side's pointing to the sun, generating power, and then we've got our comm system. We've got some sort of sensors. Um, you can see for the different parts of its mission, and this is where we want to look at what have sort of power levels, so what, what things are actually on and need power during those parts. And that's how you have to size your power system. You can see the maximum power is when it's on station, so that's when it's doing its um, kind of sensing, when it's doing some sort of um, science uh, operation, and it's then sending data back. So we've got the service module, which is providing all of the power to the service systems, and then the payload. The payload is doing the thing that does all of the science on board. And you can see, sort of on station, both of those are, are sort of operating at quite high levels. So when we size our power system, we're going to have to size it for this maximum condition here. But it might be that if we size our solar arrays slightly lower and we use a battery then to to be able to give us this peak power. So we might size our solar arrays to operate in the cruise condition, and then we give our, our battery is going to top things up when we're operating at peak power. So these are all things that you start to, to look at when you're sort of looking in the detailed design of a, of a power system on board a, a spacecraft. So it's not just simply how much power do I need. Um, you have to think about when you need that power and how that power is distributed over the mission lifetime as well. Okay, so how do we go about sizing then? Well, first of all, do we have any questions on that? Or are fairly happy with that? Yeah? Okay. So how do, we go, how do we go about sizing? So if we've got a given power demand, um, we need to determine when we're in eclipse. And you've done this for the thermal um, tutorial last week. Yeah, so you, in MATLAB you're like working out what the eclipse period in, a, in an orbit was. So it's, it's a, a very basic geometric. We can, in, in kind of um, first order terms, work it out from the basic geometry of the orbit. Okay, we can determine what for a circular orbit. It's quite easy. We can determine for what the period is, and then we can assume, okay, this part of the orbit we're going to be in eclipse, and we can look at the geometry of that and work out how, what the angle is in relation to the full 360, um, and that we give our period for our eclipse. <coughs> so then we can work out the time in the sunlight, and then we can work out how, many, how long is our mission, how many charge-discharge cycles are we going to have over a mission, so how many, how many of these eclipse periods are we going to have over our entire mission duration. Um, and so we start to see, okay, we're getting some of these numbers, like N, charge discharge cycle, um, and they're going to start to populate what we need in terms of the performance of our battery. So then we size um, the power source. So if we, we have to make some assumptions here about what, how, how our electrical architecture is built, okay, so we have to assume what our bus voltage is. So typical satellite bus voltages are anywhere between 5 and 28 volts. Okay, so most, most of the systems that you see that plug into satellites will operate on, on that sort of vol voltage level. Okay. 
Okay, so there will be some systems that will operate at higher voltages, so you'll need to have some sort of regulators to, to operate them. So electrical propulsion systems, for example, might need higher voltages to operate. Um, and we need to know what our battery energy density is and the average cell voltage. So those, those are dependent on the battery chemistry. So we can look at what's battery chemistry, get those values. Um, and then we need to work out how many cells have we got. So how many cells is dependent on what, what is our bus voltage and what is our cell voltage. That will give us the number of cells that we need. Okay. And then we can work out what the total capacity is. So that's the power at the... What do you think EOL stands for? End of life. End of life, yeah, okay. Good. Am I right? Yes, you're, you're absolutely correct there. So why do you think we want to size it based on what power we need at the end of life? Because, because at the end of life, it's less than that at the beginning of life. So our systems are degrading, yeah. So, yes. so uh, we have to make sure that we're able to produce enough power in our system um, even if our systems have degraded towards the end. So, so we need to make sure that we're sizing the capacity of our battery to, to be able to provide the power that we need at the end of the mission. And we've got our T, E, our eclipse period, our depth of discharge, how much we're, we want, we're allowing our battery to go down to, and our battery voltage, yeah? So it's the voltage that our battery is operating at. So then we can work out the total energy, and then from that, we know that if we know the total energy, we can work out, if we know the energy density of our, our battery chemistry, we can work out the mass of our battery. Um, I think we've got, we've got to <laughs> wrap up here, but the last few slides, okay, and you can go through these, and they will be useful for you tomorrow in your own time, but shows you how, in a similar vein, we can go through and size the solar array in order to power the battery uh, to generate that power um, and hopefully if you've got any further questions on this we can answer it tomorrow in the tutorial but essentially it's a it's a very straightforward calculation on how we're powering them next week we're going to move on to to um, communications okay so we'll need the power but tomorrow we we're, on our tutorial we're going to go through some more power stuff so if you've got any questions on this there please ask them i'll see you tomorrow then portion of it, isn't it? So you're given, yeah, like so you were given the area of, of the yeah, portion. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just that, that will simplify it. Yep.
Yep. 